So Nick, Nick Barker. Now let's let's just set this up. So Nick Barker, Nick Barker and the reptiles, Nick Barker from the Heartache State. Nick Barker, for me, when I was growing up, has been, I believe, one of the best songwriters in Australia. I know he gets embarrassed, etc. But when I look at Australian rock and roll, I look at you, you know, they talk about the Paul Kellys and the Richard Claptons, et cetera, et cetera. My personal opinion and the opinion of many others in this country is that Nick Barker is up there with the best. <laughs> and there's absolutely no doubt. The way you write songs, the way you construct songs, the way you, you sing songs are some of the best in Australia, if not the world. And I will add that your music today is actually more relevant than any of these other guys. So, <laughs> Nick... Thank you for chatting to me for a couple of minutes uh, so we can get the, the, the message out to the world with what we're doing on Golden Robot Records. My pleasure. Where are you uh, living at the moment? You're in Melbourne? Yeah. <laughs> Plague Central. I know. You're all shut down, aren't you? Yeah, we are this week. Is a shutdown good for a musician like yourself that can spend more time isolated? I know you're with the family, which is great. Um, then again, isolated with our own family. Sometimes it's not such a good thing, but we'll talk about that later. But um, I know that I couldn't be isolated with my family because that I'd, I'd end up with stab wounds. But um, <laughs> are you? Are you? Is it, is it good for you where you can write more material and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera? Is that a good thing? Uh, it's never really made any difference to me with the way I write. Like whether. You know, it didn't make any difference to me in the last 12 months when we had, six, you know, between six months where we were on again, off again, being allowed out. And that, that really didn't make any difference to me. What made a difference to me was not like the music industry shutting down, you know, like there was no gigs, there was no, you know, I've done gigs all my life, you know, since I was 17, that's how, I've, you know, I've, I've done gigs. And this has been the first time in 40 years pretty much where I haven't done a gig in 12 months, you know? Yeah. yeah. So there was more of that, that that changed my perspective on on things and where I fit in. And, and you know, I guess when you're playing live a lot and you're chasing gigs and, you, and you're seeing what's popular and you, I do, I tend to get influenced by what's going on. And so, so not having that, I guess I just wrote from the heart a lot more, you know, I just wrote kind of tried to make a record for me. So that was the that was the only way it affected me. It just, I wasn't out playing, so I wasn't thinking about it. And, you know, playing live for me, you know, these days it can be the best thing in the world or the worst, you yeah. know. When you have good nights, it's great. But when you have bad nights, it's like, what the fuck am I still doing this for, yeah. you know? It, it, you're it, kind of bulletproof when you're in your 20s. You don't care if there's five people there and you've just yeah. driven a thousand kilometers, yeah. you know, you just have yeah. 10 beers and you go, but kind of when you're in your fifties, it, it's, <laughs> it takes a bit more of an emotional toll because you, you know, I mean, let's face it. You mentioned Paul Kelly in that before. That's what every kind of middle-aged songwriter wants to be. You know, mm. they want to be in a room full of adoring fans and you can hear a pin drop you know, in, in a packed mm. theatre going, oh, my God, it's just mm. amazing. But mm. unfortunately, the reality for the, the bulk of us isn't that. You know, we're still out kind of schlepping around. So it, it can take, you know, it, it can it can fuck with your head, you know. Mm. And that, in turn, fucks with your songwriting, right? Because you sort of go, well, what's the point, you know? Yeah, but is it is it really, how does it make you feel where you've got a record label like Golden Robot and a, and a, and a CEO that's a fan that will um, is really excited to put your music out for you. So what I'm saying is you've got a home to put your music out. Is that a good feeling that no matter what you put out, I mean, I, you don't put out shit, all your stuff's good, but is it a nice feeling to know that you've got that kind of support that when you do have an album ready, it can go out to the world? Oh, you don't have to shop it around. It's incredibly... I mean, you know, you've gone from having virtually no one interested in me <laughs> to having you guys interested in what I'm doing. You know, it's incredibly comforting. I mean, I was on, as you know, Mushroom Records for a really long time until 1998 when they sold up 
So I made the Reptiles records and two solo albums on Mushroom. And that was a big thing when, when they kind of didn't re-sign me. And it was, you know, they, Michael was good about it, you know. He just said, look, we're going to sell the company. We're not really, you know, kept my publishing. Still got my publishing with him. But I was, I was pretty gutted at the time. Mm. And, you know, and I've bounced around and had, you know, independent releases and I've been with a few little labels and stuff. So, you know, but to have a label that's willing to, to back you, of course, especially nowadays, I mean, things have changed, you know, things aren't, aren't, you know, a lot of, not a lot of people have a kind of golden robot type mentality about the music industry anymore. You know, everyone's very, very wary. Yeah. And fair enough because, you know, it's, it, it's, it's changed a lot and it can be hard to navigate. Do you, do you, do you, and, and that's a segue into the fact that we've now got Golden Robot Records as your back catalogue now, including all the reptiles uh, material. And, and it's, it's very humbling for me because listening to you in the early 90s and, and loving your music back then and now, um, to now look up um, you know, a particular song and then see Golden Robot down the bottom as the um, under, under our lab, under our kind of catalog is a really cool thing for me. And no matter how big we've built this, and no matter where it stands in the marketplace, it's 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 nice to be able to you know see those things and 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 have your name associated with ours and vice versa. So it's a it's a very happy two way street between us. It always has been. I mean, I can I can tell you now, mate. I remember getting the email from somebody that was very down on their luck and contemplating awful things in their life and contemplating doing awful things. And they heard the Heartache State album and it really turned their life around. It gave them this, this um, uh, uh, you know, every dark cloud has a silver lining. It gave them that silver lining. Wow. And I'll never forget that. And I always felt how amazing that was that, we made that album that might not necessarily have got out to so many people or would it have been the second album, would that have been made? No, it definitely um, wouldn't have been made. Yeah. yeah. I would have just ended up kind of gone back into my cupboard of songs and yeah. the songs would have turned up. But, you know, records are like that and songs are like that. You, you, you know, I, they're not my songs once I've written them, you know, and that's because, I mean, let's face it, my, my lyrics can be can be pretty hard to navigate sometimes. I mean, I kind of think I know what I'm saying, but it's more landscape, you know, Yes. rather than portrait, if you know what I mean. If I can yes. put it in digital terms that I write as a landscape, you know, so they're not as kind of, you know, 100%. they're easier for people to take and hang on their own wall, if yeah. that makes sense, you yeah, know. 100%. And, well, that's the good thing about you is you can um, take your lyrics as you saying it, or you can take your lyrics to heart as in it's coming out of me. And they're kind of ambiguous lyrics too. Like, mm. and I like that because that they're, they're the sort of songwriters I like. I like guys like Paul Westerberg. I like guys, you know, like Jason Isbell that, that, that twist old sayings and yeah. put them, you know, they use metaphor and they use, you know, I mean, we use colloquialisms in lyric writing and, you know, sometimes it's laziness that you do it, but, yeah. It always makes sense in the end, you know, because songwriting's, you know, I'm not Nick Cave. I don't go and sit in a room and, you know, I, I can't be disciplined like that. It's really yeah. haphazard the way I go about it. But, yeah, right. you know, after listening to interviews with Tom Petty and, and some people who are my favourite songwriters, you know, that's a good thing about the internet. All this stuff's come to light, things that, you know, and you've there's, there's, there's interviews with people about how they go about the process. You realise there's no right or wrong way and that you're... Your way of doing it is just as relevant as anybody else's. So I have, basically, I've had times in my life where I've gone, God, you know, I've got to get more disciplined about this. And then I've realised that, no, you don't. You just do it the way you've been doing it. And if it works, it works. And so that's the way I kept going. But, you know, as you, back to your point about the lockdown side of it, it it's weird. I mean, it's it's had a, I mean, people don't realise that Melbourne was really locked down. I mean, yeah. it, you know, and it had different sorts of effects on, on different sorts of people artistically, you know. Yeah. But a lot of people had big epiphanies about what they do and where they fit in. And, you know, I guess I, I was part of that as well. But but I also think that, you know, if you're going to be a musician for any length of time, that 
you know, you're not going to have pandemics where people are getting sick and dying. I mean, you know, it's fucking serious, but you're going to have years where it just doesn't make any sense to you. And you, and it's just shit, you know. So you kind of you do get used to rolling with weird shit, I guess, is my point. But do you find like you know you and I have known each other for quite a while now, quite a few years, and um, you know to get a new solo album out of you, um, you know, you're not the kind of guy that says, "Okay, right, can you get a solo album out this year?" It's got to be done on your terms and the way you want to do it. And I've always respected that, and I always wait patiently. And yes. You are, you are working on a solo album at the moment. Is this solo album that you're working on, which is a byproduct of, of the shutdown? Because oh, without it, a doubt. Is it, is it different to anything else? Like we just put your back catalogue up and you can, you can, if I hear a Nick Barker song, I can hear a Nick Barker song. It can change a little bit from bluesy to rock to a little bit of country with, say, the last single, um, Where I Want to Be. But do you find... Uh, well, the, the new single, I should say, um, the new remastered single, to be exact. <laughs> um, do you, do you find that this particular album is a real? Um, it, it's a real product of the times of where you are right now. Well, it's funny because you know now that I'm, it, it's more like a. I made a record called "Annie Get Your Guru," which was very similar in my approach to this album, in, in as much as I just made it with the drummer. You know, like, and I'm not a really good guitar player, but I've got good melody. And so, like, in a recording studio, I can become a good guitar player mm. by the sum of about four or five different parts. Because mm -hmm. I really love bands. Like, I'm a, you know, people probably don't realise I'm a huge fan of early 90s. That, that, that kind of shoegazing British rock, like Swerve Driver and Ride mm -hmm. and Catherine Wheel and bands like that. And Swerve Driver's probably my favourite all-time guitar band. I love Swerve Driver. And they layer and they layer up these beautiful, rich sounds. I mean, I'm not saying that that's what I'm capable of doing, but that's my guitar playing is like that. And, and you know, because I've been doing this with Shane Omara in lockdown and he's just got like 400 effects pedals. He's your producer at... Um, the Oxfield Studios. The Oxfield yeah. Melbourne, yeah. So I've been able to... I've been able to play a lot more guitar... And it's not just kind of like standard rock guitar. So it's, you know, I mean, most people, any, anybody who's a Nick Barker fan will will, will recognise me in this record and go, yeah, it's a solid Nick Barker outing. But for mm -hmm. me, it's I've just been able to kind of play a lot more guitar. And it's, I wouldn't say it's less rock, but it's definitely not like the last two albums I made. I've got a different drummer who plays more like Ringo, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, can, I, ask you, can I ask you a question? question? You do do a few, you've done the last few albums since I've known you with Shane. And obviously you have, you have a really good working. Well, I trust him. A hundred percent. You trust him. And, and he's a, he's a great guy. How would you feel if you went over to wherever, London, LA, wherever, and you actually worked with someone different? How would that change the album? Would it be difficult because you don't know and trust that person? Or would it well, bring a different Yes, and they would let me work like two hours at a time. Yeah. Once a week, <laughs> which is how I like to work, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't like rec I don't like recording studios, you know. I never have. I've always, yeah. I've always been into. You, you know, I have a problem with like multi track. I'm the sort of person who should record on four or eight track. Yeah, and I have done that because I need a full stop. I need someone to go. That's it. We've run out of track. Sorry. Yeah. But now with Pro Tools and everything, there's just infinite possibilities, which drives me. Fucking insane. What if I do this? What if I do that? And that's where like a band like the Heartache State was good for me because once it was done, it was done. Once everyone had played their bit. Yeah. But now I'm back to kind of recording solo. I'm back faced with those choices. And I don't like getting in. I hate, I've really come to hate solo records where people get in a cast of thousands and yeah. try and rope in people who've got a name and that kind of thing. Like I just I find it kind of cheapens it somehow. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I like to try and do everything myself, which definitely cheapens it. <laughs> but it's a definite Nick Barker record, you know. Yeah, yeah it's you. You know, and like I get Shane guitar, Shane Amara is one of the best guitar players in the country, and he's sitting right beside me watching me fucking beat myself up playing guitar parts that I could give him, and he could play in two seconds. But you know, and I'm sure he'll end up playing a couple of bits and pieces on it, but. 
I just find, you know, it's this for this record, it's got to be me, you know, and it sounds fucking great. You know, it's got a real great sound to it, you know, I that I wouldn't be able to get with a band. So, yeah, I can't wait to hear it. Let me, let me ask you a question. What's the best thing about being Nick Barker? Well, you know, the best thing about being me is I'm a lot more comfortable in my 50s than I was in my 40s. Mm -hmm. And I'm a lot more comfortable in my 40s than I was in my 30s. So, mm -hmm. you know, the older you get, the less competitive you get. And well, that's the, I would never have done reptile shows 10, 15 years ago. I just wouldn't. I was almost embarrassed of them, mm. which is fucked, mm. you know? Now you're embracing now, now I'm older, I've come to embrace, you know, what a great fucking bar band we were. Yeah. And that's all we ever were and that's all we ever wanted to be. Yeah. You know, we didn't want to be Guns and Roses, which we were tried to, or, you know, they tried to make us really puffy a bit, you know. And But at the end of the day, when we played in bars and, and just would, we were just drunk five nights a week playing 200 gigs a year, Drumming. we were at our best. Yeah. And we were we were the fucking real deal, man. Like we yeah. really lived it. And you know, I'm not proud that we were drunk five nights a week, but I'm proud of what sort of band because we were a real band. And so I guess getting older, it's become easier because now that I'm, I'm, and I guess you know, having like met up with you and been able to get my, you know, continue on, I'm just becoming, I guess, a little prouder of what I've achieved. Whereas mm. I was always a little ashamed of it because I thought people thought I was a bit of a joke or something. I don't know. Look, the, the Australian music industry is incredibly small and incredibly, you know, it's under a... Insular. Do you know what I mean? It's very insular. Yeah. And I came from a really alternative, like playing in small bands in the 80s, playing in the recre and, you know, I was rubbing shoulders with kind of the elite... Yeah of the Melbourne art scene and yeah. then going to being in reptiles and being in Dolly magazine and all this shit. Yeah. Yeah. People just thought I was, you know, all yeah. my old peer group just would probably like, you know. Would, would you think and they I, were a little I had bit, a lot of... Would, would, would they have been a little bit jealous of the success though? Would they have liked... I mean, obviously they looked at it and, and, and looked at it as a sellout. Doing a cover it, and that kind of thing, yeah. I mean... They, they might have been a bit jealous. Yeah, I guess, look, in my mind, I, I build it all up, I guess, a lot. But I also think that, you know, and then we ran kind of smack bang into kind of the whole grunge thing and big yeah. day outs and that. And that, yeah. you know, that pretty wiped, much wiped the floor with the reptiles bar band model. You know, yeah. things change. Yeah. People don't realise how how kind of that whole Seattle thing turned the music industry on its head because I was, you know, the reptiles had just made that loose EP, which was the most representative thing we ever did. Mm. You know, it really did sound like a Black Crows record, which was kind of where we were always at. Mm -hmm. And then, it, you know, we were finally starting to be the Georgia satellites that we always wanted to be or the Jason and the Scorchers. And then it, all of a sudden grunge came and record companies just, they just were not interested in anything else. Mm. You know, I don't think people realise what a monumental effect that kind of two-year period had on the music industry, you know? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. there it wasn't just us. There was a lot of bands. Even if you read that Black Crows book, they talk about it. You know, yeah. it yeah. just was this wave of of kind of, you know, it stopped the music industry in its tracks. Really, yeah. do you, do you think it was a weird time? Do you think that? Uh, well, I can tell you one thing, one hundred percent, that no matter who I speak to about you over the last five years now or back then. Uh, no one looks at you, as you said, as a joke or whatever. Everyone has major respect for you. So I can tell you that one hundred percent. Secondly, why the reptiles now? Because you've got some gigs coming up, and uh, which is really exciting, and I'm absolutely pumped with it. Why the reptiles now? And would you think about new music? Well, we did it. I mean, you've got on the catalogue there. You've got that single we put out in 2018. Yeah. Because we did our 30 year. I think it was 30 year. Yeah, our 30 year reunion. Uh the band, as I said, we reformed ages ago to do the community cup down here, and it was all a bit haphazard. But the band's still good. Yeah. Like the last gig we did was, you know, reptiles. You know, everything's a little slower. <laughs> we don't play songs as fast as we used to, which benefits it. It's a lot more of a kind of good pub blues band than it, than it was. 
because we're not playing at a thousand miles an hour. But you know, I miss the guys too, like me and Chris, the harmonica player. You know, we've been friends since I was, you know, he used to go with my older sister, so we've been friends since I was, you know, I've known him since I was 10 years old. So, you know, we talk a lot, and you know, I just felt that. I guess during lockdown and that too, you get a little bit kind of, you get a bit sort of, I don't know, I just, I'm like anybody else, I get a bit nostalgic, you know, and, and look, and let's face it, you know, it's pretty easy to sit, you know, people threw a fair bit of money at us too, to play. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's a financial aspect of these things because people go, why don't you come and do this? Why don't you come and do that? I mean, you know, yourself, you've got to fly five guys here and do this and do that. Someone offers you a bunch of money to play at one of these wineries with eight other bands that you used to tour with 35 years ago. You think your initial reaction is go, oh fuck, really? Mm. You know, because you're you're off doing your solo stuff and you think you don't want to go back. But then you kind of think, you know, there's still a lot of people that I don't know. It just got to a point where I thought, how about just do it for fun? You know, it doesn't have to be a new record. There doesn't have to be an end game, but yeah. sometimes it's good to see the boys and just have a few beers and, you know. You're a camaraderie guy. You like the camaraderie of a band. There's well, no I like game. the Reptiles camaraderie because we were a proper gang, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've try, you know, I, my mistake was trying to emulate that with Heartache State, stuff like that. It's not going to happen. I've realised that now, but, you know, but I'm also, I'm also a a heart guy, you know, I'll do things with my heart, you know, and I'm not, you know, and quite often they're the wrong decisions, but that's all right. You know, you can't, rock and roll is an emotional business. You can't think your way through it. Nobody can. Yeah. You know, and reptiles was an incredibly tumultuous period, you know. I mean, I I was on methadone. I'd been a fuck, I'd been on heroin, you know, all those things were going on. Mm. And, you know, we became really big really quick and it was, we, it all happened in three, four years, so we never really got a chance to look. There was some stuff to to, to go through, and reforming to do gigs was the only real way we could kind of go back and address that as friends. Yeah, and it's nice now; it's comfortable, and I, you know, I can still sit in a van with them guys for for ten hours. If I, well, hopefully, I don't have to. But if I had to, I could. You know, well, it's and that's saying something. I mean, only is. someone who's been in a band would know what that means. Yeah, it's interesting because I remember going through the whole horse head when horse head got back together and we did the box set and we did everything. Um, what I underestimated after doing a deal with this label and that label and doing a deal with the band so I could put it all back together. What I underestimated was the baggage from the band from 20 years ago. Oh, there's baggage. And they the band. Yeah. And I under and they got through it and it's it's great, but um I underestimated that because I wasn't there, I wasn't part of it. So if you can, whatever happened back then, if you can leave it back then um, and move forward and everyone's a bit older and wiser and uglier, it, it, it makes sense. And I think well, that's... It, makes you look, it, it also makes you... I mean, I went from never, ever am I going to play that, make me smile again, never, ever will I do reptiles to, to going, yeah, why not, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. a big shift for me. But yeah, you know, I don't care. You know, you, people, musicians are always making bloody grandiose statements and then going back on it. You know, I don't care about that side of it. What I care about is now I can, I can look back on those reptiles days with a lot more fondness now that I've yeah. that I've managed to get back together with the guys and build the bridges, and I'm happy. I like it that we can do a few shows every couple of years. Yeah, I think it's cool. When are these shows? When are the shows coming up? Well, the the old people's big day out is in. Um, 16th of November up in the Hunter Valley at Hope Estate. Mm-hmm. And that's Good a good build. That's got the tats and baby animals. And, you know, I think we're playing at about 8.30 in the morning, but that's cool because it means we can go down and play at the bridge in Roselle that night. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's what we used to do. We used to kind of do two, three gigs a day, and that's cool. Yeah. You know, rather than sitting around and drinking wine all day, we can go and do another gig and... You know, we did that. I've forgotten how much, and we did that gig for you, even though it was kind of kind of stiff. We, I've forgotten how good the bridge is. It's a real proper old pub, you yeah, know, pub. kind of old fashioned, dirty pub, and that's where reptiles are at home. Yeah. And I'm doing the corner on my birth, my 57th birthday on the 30th of October down here. So I've got to come down for that. 
Yeah, well, it's all kind of still weird with the ticket sales and shit down here. Who knows? Because it's all capped and strange. But I was just adamant that we want to play in a pub. It's got to be a pub where people can stand up and buy beer. And that's yeah, what we're told they're at home, you know. And we've got to be able to play for like 90 minutes, you know, plus. So that was the, that was the stipulation, you know, because the set list's long. Is the is the rider in two thousand and twenty one different to nineteen ninety two? You'd fucking want to be at the corner because I was talking to Chris the other day and we remembered we sold the corner out in about nineteen ninety. I think it was the first real yeah. sign on the door sell out with you, but that was like eight or nine hundred people then. Yeah. And the guy who was running it at the time gave us a case of West End. <laughs> Warm West End. And if anyone who drinks beer, and you would know this, that West End is the worst beer in the country. Shocking. South Australian beer. Like South Australians will probably argue with that. It's horrible. Yeah. And he gave us that and we talked about, the you know, when you get this sort of superhuman strength that people talk about when they're angry, it, we still talk about how far I was able to throw. Because he was it used to be an old hallway upstairs at the corner with rooms and he was standing one end of it. And I said, what's this? And he said, that's your rider. And Chris still remarks how far I was able to throw the <laughs> West End up the hallway. It was like tossing the caber. It was like I threw it like maybe, maybe it wasn't 20 feet, but it was certainly more than 10. Yeah, that's great. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I threw it at him. <laughs> and he went out and got us a case of VB. But yeah, anyway. nice. A cold case. A cold case of VB, yeah. That's good. And so I don't know. We we occasionally, sometimes I occasionally, if I do gigs with book through premiere, sometimes through a glitch, there's a I get the old reptiles rider delivered to me, and it's with grant fondness that I look at those two slabs and bottle of vodka, sitting there thinking, my God, how do we ever get through that? And we used to, but unbelievable. And, and that was it. Vodka and staminate we used to drink for some reason. I don't know why. We had some health kick idea behind it. <laughs> 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 so, so you got the gigs at the end of the year with with the reptiles, and when do you reckon we'll start to? See, I mean, we've actually we've got an EP coming out. We've just released "Where I Want to Be," which which is an old track, but it, we've remastered it, and it's absolutely sensational with with um, Felicity Urquhart. Yeah. And we've got an EP coming up. Tell us a bit about that EP. Well, it's a good idea. I mean, now that there's, we talked, you know, there's now there's all, everything's digital and Spotify and everything's released on digital. It's hard for people to kind of realise what's going on. And mm. you know, people ask me where my stuff is. And now I can say to them, well, it's all up online. And the beauty of that is you can kind of, I can go through it all myself too. You know, mm, and mm, mm. we've decided to just pick out kind of, what is it, eight songs maybe? call it an EP, let's call it yep. six or eight songs that are just my favourite album tracks out of all my back catalogue. So there's stuff from Damn Mermaids, which is my favourite solo album. There's stuff from Blackwater Blues, which is the one that the track I, I wrote with Felicity Urquhart and Mick Thomas, which is where I want to be. There's stuff from Annie Get Your Guru, which is my second solo album. You know, there's there's a lot of stuff out there that people don't know is out there. So That's I guess, true. you know, it's sort of entitled songs you, yeah, you know, what is it? You, ones you forgot. Ones so you these know. are songs that, that I've forgotten and that people may not know existed or mm. they're just album tracks, but they're good ones, you know. So I, I And they're one. remastered and they've got a new yeah. lease of, you know, 2021 life to them. Yeah, and it just gives us a, a way to be able to go, oh, here, you can just click on a link. Yeah. It doesn't need to be me going, oh, I'll go out and find this this on a CD. And yeah, this, yeah. You know, it's it's unreal. Like I, I love that side of it. Like I may not, I may have problems with the whole, you know, yeah, you know, there's problems with online stuff for bands, and I guess it'll get worked out in about 400 years. But the ease that I mean, most musicians just want people to hear their stuff, and mm. that's where Spotify and, and digital platforms are, are great for that. You can just 100%. send a link, you know. So for, for the so for the fans that are that are listening to this interview, um, where are you how are you going? And then you don't have to lock there's no locking into your into your time here, a time frame or a month or anything. How are you looking with the soul the new solo album? Well it's it's three quarters done. How many tracks do you think? 
there's 11, but there's there's one track that I, you ask me on each, the more I record, the sometimes I love it. Yeah. And then the next week I'll hate it. I'm not even sure if it's going to make it, this one. <laughs> I don't know, I'm really, it's a, it's like a bad lover, this song. But uh, it's like a, it's like a, yeah, it's it's abusing me, this song, and I'm abusing it. And I've done all sorts of horrible things to it. But it's a beautiful song, and it's kind of about my son, my older son. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what's making me stick with it. But yeah. I don't know. So maybe 10, maybe 11. Might okay. be 10 with a with a hidden track. Ooh. A disclaimer. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. And you reckon um, all going well, it's now May, we'll have a single or so out by the end of the year? Maybe. Okay. No, no pressure. I'd never put pressure on you. Well, it's a look. There's, it's always that thing, isn't it? You know, songs. Some songs just record better than others, and some songs breathe better than others. Until I've got everything on them, I don't know which one. But yeah, I got one earmark for a single, and it's a beauty. Good. Sounds like Crazy Horse. You know, it's yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm excited. And heaps of shit guitar playing and. The beauty of my rec solo records is the songs, you know, they, they have very short guitar solos on them because I've got about eight bars of chops and that's it. <laughs> well, but buddy, the new drummer, man, I tell you, he's a yeah? guy. Yeah. He built my garden shed and he played on my album, this guy, you know, he's... Perfect. I haven't played with a different drummer for a long time and this guy, you know, you forget what incredible musicians there are, just... What's his name? Rock and ran in the community. His name's Leroy Cope. And he's from a band called, oh, God, he's going to shoot me now. He's got a really good band who you'd really like, actually, called um, Silver Sound with Shane O'Mara. It's like a psychedelic band, you know, that yeah. unreal. But, um, yeah, he's just, you know, a local guy. It's just Melbourne, you know. It's got these yeah. great musicians. And anyway, it gave me a bit of a new lease on life playing with something. Good. It's just really, Good. real easy. How old is he? Is he younger? He's a young cat, yeah, he's early, late 30s, you know. But it's just, I don't know, there's so many good musicians in this country, it's it's staggering. Yeah, it's true. They are, they are. All right, mate, well, okay. listen, it was a pleasure to talk to you um, about the reptiles, the shows, the new solo album. We've got the EP coming out. Um, it's yeah, all the bad boys too, Mark. What about them? Oh, extra, extra large, buddy. Why is it not here yet? I got, well, I'm getting a run done up for the the show so yeah that's good man I'm not making a mistake of doing small and medium this time Fuck no, 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 no. You're, you're, selling any of them. your crowd's getting older and potentially <laughs> <laughs> Super oh, right. got to cater them all right buddy don't go anywhere i'm going to end the recording though but hang on two seconds thank you for everything mate always a pleasure see you mate